We're talking about the U.S. economy as it relates to the business of agriculture. You don't want to miss this. Hey, Damian Mason here with a question before we hop into this episode of the Business of Agriculture. If you farm for a living, you employ a lot of amazing technology from your inputs that you put into the soil to the tractor that you sit in, your combine, the amazing data that it harvests. But has your soil analytics kept up technologically with everything else in your farming operation? I would venture to say that no, it is not. Sure, you check for your nitrogen, your phosphorus, your potassium, your micronutrients as well. But what about disease pressure? Do you know what diseases and what pests you're going to face next year? No, you don't. But you can now figure that out with Pattern Ag's predictive analytics. Think about it. They can tell you now with testing what the likelihood of facing nasty diseases, things like cyst nematode or uh, sudden death syndrome, what the likelihood of you having this in your field, then you know how to prepare, how to treat, and where to invest your money. It's using technology to make you bigger yields and therefore make you bigger money. Go to www.pattern.ag to learn more. They are pioneering the way in predictive agronomy. Hey there, welcome to another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture. We're talking big picture U.S. economy and then bringing it back to agriculture. In a episode that I just recorded and released last week, we talked to Chris Barron about farm finances and those economic issues. But let's talk about what's impacting all of us. If you are a machinery dealer, if you are in the business of selling inputs, if you work in agriculture and you are want to know what's going to go on. While we're not necessarily getting out the crystal ball, we can talk a lot about what things have done so far and then where things are going into 2024. I've got Bill Moore. He is the chief risk officer with Compeer. Compeer is a, a part of the farm credit system. And he and I were on a webinar at the end of November. And I said, you know, I like your stuff. Why don't you come on here and let's talk big picture uh, economy issues. You know, I get it that this can be boring. I get it that some people are like, man, I, I the basis points and and Fed meetings and uh, consumer confidence numbers, it's just too much numbers. One of the smartest things that ever happened to me, Bill, and it was, I believe, in Econ 415 at Purdue University, professor said, you know, you've heard about guns and butters and widgets and supply and demand curves. Let me just tell you one simple thing. Economics at its very base is about human decision making. And when you say that to the person that, like, I got friends that, man, they don't think, let's talk about how human decision making is going to change based on the economics, because one and the other basically go right down lockstep in the same aisle together. Things like the grocery store prices, things like fuel and energy, those kinds of things, and why it's going to impact all of us in agriculture. So um, I hope you like that lead in. Because you, we're going to cover a lot of ground here today, but I want you to take it from there, uh, and and then we're going to get back to the questions. Thanks for having me, Damon. Uh, I agree with you. You know, they give a Nobel Prize out for economics, but I think it's the only one that's not to a true science. You know, e economics is a psychology. You know, how do people react to the stimulus that they're that they're seeing, and and ultimately how the U.S. economy performs drives what we, you know, how we perform day to day and year to year. So people ask me, like my buddy, uh, my buddy Johnny, that's a school teacher, and he's not taking economics classes, and and I told him that very thing, and I go through, and I always bring it back to stuff that that every person sees. So while I'm not the professor, he's like Damien, I think you do a good job in bringing this back. Yes. So let's do, let's start with the beginning. Um, savings rates were pretty damn good. And here we are, we're recording this just before Christmas 2023. I should point that out, depending on when you're listening to this. And from my reading, savings rates have really plummeted. Now we're starting to rack up credit card debt. And the person that's listening to this says, I'm in the agriculture. Why do I care about Main Street? Because they are our customers. <laughs> because they go to the grocery store every week. And they are, I believe, poised to have a bit of a cutback, uh, a pullback, if you will, on spending. But right now, the numbers don't ferret that out. So let's talk about savings rates and consumer spending and then why that matters to anybody in agriculture. Yeah, if you rewind the clock back to COVID and you think about what happened to COVID, uh, jobs got shut down, people were set home, but the government did uh, their best to mitigate that by flooding the economy with cash. You know, everybody got stimulus checks, you got extra unemployment payments. And what happened was people didn't spend that money per se, they saved it. So we had this big period, probably two years in length, 
were actually what we people, what economists will call excess savings. Mm -hmm. So savings above and beyond what the the economists would expect people to be putting in their bank account just ballooned uh, up and through tw up and through twenty twenty two. So while all these people were predicting a recession to be coming, it didn't come because people had money in their pocket. You know, I, I like to say I, I've been predicting a recession to happen about now for about the last year. <laughs> but it's really hard to have a recession, Damien, when everybody has a job. You know, when you have a paycheck and you have cash balances, it's hard to see the economy recess. But, but the consumer has has basically blown through the, those savings rates uh, it's starting about now. If you look at a chart of, of where that excess savings, like I said, it peaked in 2022, it's it's close down to trend now, and people are starting to to lose their jobs. So a recession is in the making. The question is, does when does it happen? Um, I like I said, I'd like to say see that I think the recession will happen in the next quarter or two. But here's the caveat I have also: it's also a presidential election year, and you and I know what happens in that time period. There's not been a sitting president who has been reelected in the year that he had a recession. Yeah. So the sitting president will do everything that they can to not see a recession in a year that we vote. We had a huge economic number in the third quarter. I think GDP, gross domestic product, how we measure the amount of growth that the economy sees grew 5% in the third quarter, which was a ridiculously large number. Is it because you and I were spending more and more? Nope. And there was some of that, but the big influencer was the government was putting in a ridiculous amount of money. You know, we are growing our our deficit spending. You know, spending more money than the government is pulling in in in, in income by an obscene an obscene amount over the last three years, and and that's keeping the economy afloat for now. But you know, I don't think that could last forever. Do you? No, I don't. And that's going to we're going to talk about inflation. And this is again, we're connecting dots that a lot of people really struggle. Uh, and I, I, I think it's interesting when you and I explain some economic stuff and you're more um, uh, uh, astute on some of these than I am. It's it's always, again, it's, 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 it's interesting. The vernacular might confuse someone that hasn't taken the econ classes, but in practice, they know it intrinsically. They, they know it instinctively, right? They, because they live it. They, they live these things. So what we're talking about here, and I want to bring it back to the business of agriculture. You and I said before we hit the record button, and I've said it a number of times, agriculture tends to be counter-cyclical. You could argue that we saw inflation in ag even before the whole pandemic, before the government invented inflationary pressure, because when the government flinged money out there, it made every dollar became worth a little bit less. And that's what a lot of folks don't understand. Like, oh my God, this money getting flinged around. And to a thinking person, you're like, yeah, well, when money gets flinged around like like, you know, like water, all of a sudden it doesn't have a whole hell of a lot of value. And that's what we've seen. I want to bring this inflationary thing up because we saw escalating commodity prices by about, what, 1920. And then the whole, then there was some depression because of the, the, the tariffs, et cetera, et cetera. And then we saw, you know, we, we like, my God, prices of corn like doubled or something like that in a six month time frame. Things got a little crazy. Uh, and then we saw inflation everywhere else. I tell the ag people, here's the tough part about inflation. It's very good for your real estate values because uh, as my friends at Halderman's, I, I now host the Halderman Real Estate and Farm Management webinar every quarter. Agricultural real estate tends to be a hedge against inflation because it tends to be almost like a direct correlation between inflation and appreciation of land, farm ground, especially if it's the right kind of farm ground where we get you know rain and all that kind of stuff. But inflation is good for that. It's not worth a damn for a lot of other things, including uh, upselling uh, food items when all of a sudden the consumer is trading down when they have to go from steak to burger or burger to pork or pork to chicken or chicken to spam or whatever. Where do you see the inflation thing? Because I see it being ultimately bad for agriculture because it, um, it, it has changed consumption patterns and it also hurts us pretty directly. We buy a lot of high dollar things, machinery, farm inputs, fuel, everything we pay for is pretty inflated also. And so ultimately I see this being one of our big drags. Yeah. You mentioned it and hit it on the head when you talked about if you flood the economy with cash, it 
immediately leads to inflation. And that's what we saw. Uh, we had low interest rates, near zero for many cases, a lot of money. Money was just being spent, spent, spent. There was no, there was no value in holding it. It was to go out and spend it. And we saw inflation tick up to the highest level we had seen since the 20s. It's come down since then, but it's still incrementally higher. So every every four point of, of inflation numbers that we see is just added on to the big run up that we had. So when you go to the supermarket and you and someone's telling you, well, inflation is moderated to 4%, yay. Well, that's great, but it just means it's 4% higher than it was a year ago, which was already really high. Yeah, that, I mean, that's by the way. I I want to put I want to point that out. It's almost it's not exponential. I would call it it's, it's certainly additional. Because, it's cumulative. Yeah, it's yep. cu- there you go. That's, thank you. It's cumulative because it's one thing to say, well, our inflation rate's now at four percent. Like that's fantastic. That's four percent from you know six or twelve months ago. But the number twelve months ago is twenty percent more than it had been. 14 months before that, the cumulative effect of it is that we're sitting here easily 30% more than we were four years ago if you did an entire basket of goods. Am I right? That's 100% right. And I, I like to equate it to inflation's a monster. And and we've watched plenty of, of, of monster movies over our lives. There's a difference between containing the monster and slaying the monster. Yeah. I've seen enough horror movies that when you contain the monster and you leave... The monster comes back Um, and we've not slayed inflation. We've just brought it under control. And the government statistics on inflation aren't a great measure because there's so many moving parts in it. I I saw on Black Friday, an 86 inch TV was on sale for like $399. Two, three years ago, that TV would have been $5,000. Yeah. That gets factored into the, the government inflation numbers, but the cost of milk, the cost of food in the house and out of the house, the cost of rent, that core, there's an economist out there that refers to the super core inflation. The things that cost us to live yeah. are, are higher and they're lower than they were, but they're still high and they're still high for the Fed. And that's yeah, so, yeah, that, ahead, but you, you do, a, again, the person that maybe just is driving down the road and you're listening to some you know news or what if it is news, and they'll hear this thing that, you know, inflation, core inflation, et cetera. Again, since we're in the business of agriculture, we produce stuff that people use every freaking day. <laughs> you, you, you know, you and I just both grabbed a soft drink before we hit the record button. I'm going to, I'm, I'm figuring out what I'm going to have for lunch after this call. We, we eat and drink several times a day, every day. We sell absolute something that people touch every day. They go to the grocery store at least once a week, go to fast food restaurants. And so, yeah, Black Friday, you are so right. Those electronics, a buddy of mine just said, why are you worried about taking this TV uh, off the porch every for the every season, worried that it's going to get too much weather? For God's sakes, you can buy a new one for $300. They were $3,000 10 years ago. Absolutely. So that problem there is when, when we talk about inflation or when the government talks about inflation, they'll try and tell you that inflation has come down. Yes, you don't buy a 86-inch big screen TV every damn day. You buy a sandwich every day. You buy a Coke every day, a gallon of milk every week, a dozen eggs every four days for your family. So that's where this thing gets so inflation gets inflation meets conflation, where where people are are conflating what these things are. And I think it's a real problem for us because, yeah, the big screen TVs are less. Um, I just bought a dozen eggs for $2.99. Yeah. And, you know, there, there's that's where the rub is. I don't need a damn TV every day, but I need eggs. Well, let me. So this this data is about a month old, but let me read to you in the last twelve months what the inflation were on the top end. Pets and pets products were up nine percent. Rent was up eight percent. Restaurant meals were up seven percent. By the way, this is twelve months. This is this, this was be- twelve the twelve month change from a month ago. Yeah, so about November, so about Thanksgiving time of 2023 from Thanksgiving time of 2022. Housing's up six. Uh, alcohol's up four and a half. I'm doing my best on that one. Uh, <laughs> and and the things that are going down are, are important. It's it's gasoline. That's you know airfare, rental cars, used vehicles, um, electronics, furniture. So again. Those are important things, but to your point, they're not the day-to-day things. And 
the Fed, the Fed has a job. Fed has, well, two jobs. Dual mandate. Their job is to make sure that the economy is employed, people have jobs, and their other job is to maintain and manage a healthy level of inflation, which they define as 2%. Yep. We're running, the, the, the headline numbers are a little over three, but the reality is, is we're running closer to four. So we're twice what the Fed wants to manage that rate to. And how do they manage the rate? Through interest rates. Yeah. That's how they, they do their job. They change the level of interest rates to try and manage those two things. Okay, well, let's just go ahead and throw this out there, Bill, because, again, yeah, I rent cars every week, but and this is where I, I, I hope that I don't sound like some sort of a uh, a pandering politician, but I am a bit of a populist. A uh, little alliteration there for you from pandering politician to populist. Anyway, I know the I know poor people. I was raised in a very blue collar background, and I I know the kids that you know got reduced in free lunch at school. They don't rent cars and buy airfare every every week like I do, but by God, they buy eggs and milk every week, and they buy pancakes, and and they buy and they buy cheeseburgers at the restaurant, and that's where I I we talk about stickiness of inflation. They start saying this nonsense two years ago. Well, it's transitory. Well, the average person watching the evening news had no idea what that even meant. I called bullshit the first time I heard it. Then the fourth time I heard it, I said, I'm going to have to look this up because in all of my studies and all my reading, I never heard the word transitory inflation. Well, they're trying to say temporary. It's, and I said, this is absolutely not. There's no such thing. This will not be temporary. Well, the person that's that 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 person I'm talking about that is a little tight right now because they're paying more at the grocery store. Real cars going down and and um, airfares going down doesn't do a whole hell of a lot for them <laughs> because the grocery store is still prohibitive. And yeah, gas is down a touch. Rent prices, asking rent prices are coming down a little bit, but there's still there's still a squeeze. And I I concern I'm concerned that the squeeze doesn't improve. And I think there are underlying factors that would support that statement. So a big driver of inflationary pressures is wage. So we've we've gone through uh, two plus years of transitory turning to sticky inflation that's grown at a faster pace than wages have. So by definition, the average consumer is losing money a, 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 on the treadmill. They're, they're falling back on the treadmill. Yep. So they've been trying to catch up through wage gains. We had a period of time where the, the employment, we have we have probably a two million more jobs out there than we have people looking for jobs, yep. and so finding people and 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 every farmer will know how difficult it is to find labor. Finding people in every segment of the economy was hard, but when you did, you had to pay them more. And right now, we have inflation rates on wages at like anywhere between four and six percent, depending upon what type of of job you're looking at. I mean, heck, all you have to do is read the paper and see all these strikes that are happening. UAW. What what was the UAW resolution? Well, a 25% pay increase. The top wage at UAW is going to $42 an hour. Let's talk about this wage thing real quickly. Again, we're going to bring it back to why does the person listening to the business of agriculture care? Because we like to pretend sometimes in agriculture that we're an island. Well, we're not at all. We're completely impacted by what happens in the consumer marketplace because they are who buys our stuff. And also, well, there's no running from interest rates. Interest money is fungible. Smartest thing they'll ever teach you. And, and you know, again, Econ 101, pretending that this dollar is different from that dollar, dollars are dollars. So interest rates, there's no running from that. Dollars are dollars. Marketplace is the marketplace. When you spoke about this in the webinar, I actually jotted down a couple of those numbers. I thought it was great. First big point here is you say, why would I care about the UAW strikes when I'm in the business of agriculture? Because quite frankly, it's this way. If you've got a a group that's what, 275,000 members strong, and they're willing to shut down the automotive sector, because they were, and they pretty damn effectively did so, to attain a raise, when things weren't terrible before that, but they were convinced you can't live without us, A. So it's not like, oh boy, you'll never, you'll, you know, if they, they'll just hire in a bunch of uh, strike breakers. There's no strike breakers. There's nobody that's going to come in and do that job. And number one. Number two, for them to push this through as, what it take, 30 days, less than 15 days to get it done. And the big companies, 
that, it, let's face it, are essentially backed by the government. You get, the United States government has bailed out Chrysler twice, GM once. I mean, and it was a 25% over what, four years was it, Bill? 25% over, I think it was a five-year agreement topping at $42 an hour. And also there was pay, there was a uh, cost of living adjustments additional. So they not only got 25% pay raise over five years, they also got a, a component that ties to the cost of living. You say $42. Well, if we continue to have these inflationary rates, 42 is going to become 51. Yeah. So you also on that webinar spoke about the the service employees union pushed through huge uh, negotiated pay raises. That'd be like the motels and hotels. hotels and casinos and all those. Yep. And then there was another one that you uh, you mentioned on. My, my two favorite, one was from the webinar and one's just recent, was uh, the Washington Post journalist went on a day strike. Uh, my my favorite quote in listening to that was someone asked one of the strikers, who's going to write the fake news uh, if you're on strike? And, uh, and the other one was, and I very coincidentally happened to have a Starbucks red cup in front of me. Uh, the, on Red Cup Day, the 9,000 baristas at 380 stores walked out on Red Cup Day because they wanted better benefits, better pay, and most importantly, they wanted to turn off the mobile ordering piece of your phone on promotion days because it was too stressful to the workers. So, uh, and by the way, I just saw a video of artichoke harvest and you got men almost running through a field wearing waterproof uh, rubber pants with machetes, hacking these plants down, toss them onto a conveyor belt, going through this machine, where then the guys in the machine were grabbing them off the bear belt and putting them into a different thing. And I thought, after about a day of that, you'd really be sore and tired. Not to not to undermine the stressfulness of receiving a mobile order as a Starbucks barista, but dare I say that there might be some people in farm laboring positions that are maybe a little more stressed. Hey, before we go on to the next thing, I want to ask you, if you're in the business of agriculture, do you find yourself looking for information? Do you need advisors? Well, more importantly, do you just need information? AgVisor Pro is an app you can put on your phone. My buddy Rob Syke, agricultural entrepreneur and friend of mine, he started this company called AgVisor Pro. It's now actually moving to Visor Pro. It's going to have a lot of new offerings. You should check it out. Just go on there, put it on your phone. Don't cost nothing. It's AgVisor Pro. It's going to become Visor Pro. It's a exchange of information. Basically, it's a platform where you can seek answers to questions that you have from professionals that know what the heck they're doing. AgVisor Pro, put it on your phone. Anyway, um, what was the Starbucks uh, negotiated uh, deal then? What did they get? Uh, well, I think they they only did a day walkout, so I don't think they actually. It was more of a statement than a uh, than a uh, a winning issue. But we'll see. It, it 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 could press on. But the key we talked a lot about inflation and why it matters to the consumer because you're right. You you will trade from beef to pork to chicken or or some combination thereof. But the other thing that's important directly to farmers is the impact on interest rates. Uh, we've had, uh, well, we, we had probably eight years of interest rates that were far, far too low. Uh, the, the, the person who coined the term transitory inflation was Janet Yellen, who was the Fed chairman at the time. She's now the Treasury Secretary today under, under Joe Biden. Um, she had a job. She had one job, and that was to, to get us out of zero interest rates. And she failed to do so. And that buildup caused a big backlog. Uh, Jerome Powell, who's the new chair of the Fed, he's a, he's he's at least trying to fight inflation, and he got us out of zero. But all along the way, for so a good year and a half, everyone anticipated where the Fed would stop raising rates, and then followed on with when would they start cutting rates, and they were wrong. At every point, every point when the rates were at two, they said they were going to stop at three. When rates got to three, they said they were going to stop at four. When they got to four, it said they were going to stop at five. We're now at five and a quarter on the Fed funds rate. Uh, I don't know when this will get released. We have a meeting today. I do not think the Fed will do anything today. But for the most part, the market thinks we're done at the Fed. They will stop raising rates. I think there's a decent chance that is true. Um, what I don't think is true is the market is starting to factor in, okay, if we see a recession, if you look to the past, every time we have a recession, the Fed cuts rates. That's what the Fed does. But it wasn't in an inflationary environment like we have. Mm -hmm. So I think even if we have a recession, 
the Fed is going to be very, very slow to cut rates because if they do, they open the door to that that Pandora's box, that genie out of the bottle um, that you that they let inflation run away. And it happened in the late '60s. In the late '60s, the inflation seemed to have come down. The Fed started cutting rates, and what happened? 1970s inflation just took off again. Yeah, uh, or just took off the first time. It it double dipped during the the 70s. So what you, didn't you That's compare this? About. Didn't you compare this to a scary movie? So Michael Meyer, we didn't slay Mike. We did. We we he fell off the balcony. We stabbed him and shot him. But he came back for Halloween three or five or Halloween 19. It's the same thing you're talking about, and it's it's pervasive. And it seems hard for folks to get, including even you and me sometimes. And we we study a little bit why it's so hard to contain. We can see it like right now, okay, from Starbucks to UAW to the service employees to whoever saying, I want to ask more for more money. You don't fault them for asking for more money. Everything they go and spend money on, I asked to raise my rates, not because I'm being greedy, because every single thing that Mrs. Mason and I, <laughs> I want to get her some Christmas presents, they're more expensive. We go to the grocery store, it's more expensive. We might go out and have a drink and uh, appetizer. That's where I swear to God, you go out and you're like, what happened? We just, yeah. we, just had, we just had two beers and a and an order of cheese cheese curds and it's what? Mm-hmm. Oh, so you don't fault these people for asking for more money. So then they ask for more money and they talk about the the ratchet up effect or the wage effect. I ask for more money because things are going up. Things keep going up because now the people that pay me have to ask for more money. Where where and how does it end, Bill? So it's a it's a self fulfilling cycle because if I expect inflation. I'm going to get inflation because I ask for more, I, I I I spend more, I expect things to go up, and it just it keeps rolling, which is why it's so hard to get Pandora back in that box. It's why the Fed has such a big thing in front of it. And I, I the answer, how do you get it back in? I'm not sure, but here's the problem I see. If you looked at the expected inflation rate over a year, it varies quite a bit. You know, you and I could to, could agree on probably where we think inflation will be in six months. The real key is where do we think inflation will be in five years? And that that number doesn't move as much. And for probably 15 years, that number was between two and two and a half percent. In general, where do people think inflation will be in five years? Mm-hmm. That number's crept up to three and a half. Mm-hmm. That's a problem because if people expect inflation, they ask for more in their pay and they're willing to spend more you know, in the moment, the Fed has to get that number down. So, uh, you know, we like to bring this again back to agriculture because I know there's a lot of folks in agriculture that, you know, like, well, why, why would this matter to me? All right, I'm just going to throw one example out. Um, whether it's the Starbucks or, in my comparison to the artichoke harvesters, these artichoke harvesters, and this is something that we've had to, those of us in this industry have had to explain to a lot of uh, non-ag people. Well, you take those people in from foreign countries and you just work them like slaves. I'm like, that's not true. I said, well, you don't pay them anything. I've heard that before from the anti-modern agriculture. Well, they bring those people in and work for those factory farms. They don't pay them anything. I'm like, well, if the guy that milks cows doesn't pay someone from another country that milks the cows a competitive rate, that person right now is going to go harvest artichokes. If they don't want to work in agriculture, they can go in and put up drywall. They can go and work in landscaping. They can work. We've got a construction business that still has plenty of employment to you know to spend around. And we just talked about the service workers. We just talked about all these other places. The cost of farm labor is going to go up. It already has, and it almost might be unavailable. Now, there's someone listening that says, well, I don't know, farmers, uh, they just do all the work themselves. Well, that's not really true. There's a lot of uh, livestock, et cetera. So speak a little bit to the farm labor situation as you see inflation affecting that. And then we'll talk about inflation affecting what we sell. Yeah, I think the the farm labor is a crisis issue, Uh, not only what you have to pay, but in order to be able to find people. I mean, I've seen the numbers in the news, two, two million illegal immigrants crossing the border every year. Um, that's fine and dandy, but if they're not legal to work, you can't put them to work. I think there was a, one of the politicians said, well, hey, why don't we just give them jobs? Well, because you get raided by ICE and, and be in trouble. So finding finding people to do the work is one problem. It is pushing people towards technology. 
I don't know if you've been on a dairy farm recently, but you know, I'm a I'm a suburban kid from Boston, Massachusetts. Um, when I saw my first robotic milker, I was blown away. Uh, <laughs> the the cows just come in and milk themselves. It's incredible, but that's expensive. That's a big capital project, and you need to be willing to make that upfront payment, take out the loan to do so, and then have the years to earn that back. Um, you you, you got to be prepared to do that. So if you can't find people. You're going to have to start investing in in autonomous stuff, and, and that is really expensive. Well, and also we're obligating. We essentially were in a realm, Bill, where money was almost had no interest attached to it. I mean, it really didn't. You could get mortgage money for two to three percent. You get operating money for four percent. You're talking about now we're in a situation where if i want to do these capital expenditures if i feel the need to automate or innovate with technology because i'm having a hard time getting employees you're not talking about two or four percent money you're talking about nine percent money and the return honest to god may not be there that's true and and if you don't mind me deviating for a second let's talk about land values so we've seen land values in in farming continue to go higher and higher you know, I think our, our appraisers estimated we grew a, a couple to 5% in land values across. We're, we're located in kind of the upper Corn Belt, Minnesota, uh, Wisconsin, and Illinois. Um, the returns you're getting on land values now have not moved. Mm-hmm. In fact, they've actually gone down. So if you take commercial real estate, which is probably uh, could be a whole podcast about mm-hmm. an economic bomb that's ready to blow up. <laughs> but the, the the cap rate, so for the audience that doesn't understand, cap rate is essentially the income you get from the property divided by the value of the property. And you can put it in percentage terms. What sort of rate of return am I going to get on that investment? Commercial real estate today is about 7%. And that's probably double from where it was just a few years ago. I, David, let me ask you, maybe you know, maybe you don't. Any idea what the rough cap rate on farmland is today? Probably about two and a half. It's, it's, in Minnesota and Illinois, it's under that. It's closer to two. Uh, and and not only is it two, it's probably a quarter lower than when rates were at zero. So, so by we, the way, just to, to, again, to help the, the person out, because we threw a lot of numbers there, I meaning if you went and bought a piece of Minnesota farmland tomorrow at an auction, what would you expect? And, and, uh, you pay cash for it, let's just say, whatever, and then you would get about a two and a quarter percent return? Correct. And and we substitute for easy purposes cash rent. So what's the cash rent? If I want to buy land, you know, I'm not, I'm a terrible, I'd be a terrible farmer just for the record. Uh, I would be a terrible farmer, but I could buy land and rent it to someone else and get a return in cash rent. So that cash rent divided by the value of the cost of the property gives me what I would yield from it. So the point when, is cash rent essentially is the same thing, Bill, as cap rate. For this discussion and if you're talking about i could go and buy uh, a building that walgreens up rents from me and i can get a seven percent return which probably couldn't on a walgreens but let's just say a piece of commercial real estate on the corner over here um seven percent on my money there two and a quarter percent on farm ground in minnesota the thinking person would say why the hell would i buy farm ground then two percent versus seven percent well let's rewind the clock three years ago the 10 year treasury rate. So risk free rate, lend the government money, they'll pay me 2%. Farmland cap rates were about 250, two, two, two and a half percent. Today, the government is the, the government instrument is getting you anywhere between four and five percent. So it's gone more than double. Yet farmland cap rates have actually gone down by a quarter. So they've they've not moved. Now, I'm not here to suggest that I think farmland values are going to go down. I think there's a lot of uh, fundamental factors that are driving farmland prices, but I'm in ri- I'm in risk management. My job is to look at what could go wrong. Yeah. You know, obviously the price of commodities could, could be a disruptor for the industry. You know, global economic malaise or war could be a problem. Um, you know, where we source our inputs from could be a problem. Did you know that? You know, a large uh, producer of potash and, and phosphate is Israel. I, I I only learned that like three months ago. Yeah, uh, yeah. So but, so like that, you start looking at. What, and by the way, you're kind of he, chief risk officer. What they should really do is nickname it Chicken Little. He's Chicken Little <laughs> for Compeer. He has to he has to use an economic uh, uh, 
career and then a sky is falling mentality to tell everybody, oh my God, oh my God, it's all going to end. The world's going to end. But the reality is, the, the good news is usually these things become overstated. In other words, okay, Israel's situation is certainly not good from a humanitarian standpoint, but from the standpoint of fertilizer, it's still a very small country, and there's a and the world's a big place, so we still can get phosphates and pot, potassium, you know, potash products, uh, other places. So it singularly isn't going to do it, but it's a contributory. It comes to that cumulative thing again, Bill. I think is what you're talking about. Yes, yeah. you just named a bunch of things that individually they don't wreck the bicycle but cumulatively they could wreck the bicycle and that's exactly what what we try and do here and i i analogize it to the farmer is things could go bad you know farmland could go down 20 percent. i'm not here saying it would but it it's it's not unfeasible that it could happen yep. you want to make sure you've not positioned your operation or in my case our association that if those bad things happen i'm out of business um, and so you look at the spectrum of where could interest rates go? Every Everyone in the world says interest rates are going down. What if they don't? Everyone says farmland's going up. What if it doesn't? Yeah. And then run that through, and I, I'd say a model, but I'm using that very, very loosely. That could be a back of the envelope calculation, but yeah. what would happen to my financial position if these things happened? And if if I get to the bottom of the math and it says, oh my God, I'm I'm out of business, then maybe I got to do something today. What about price? And I appreciate all that, uh, but moving along here, because the person listening to this, maybe they sell, like my friend Bobby Brockman, she's overseas North America, uh, calf medicine inputs, vaccine products that go into calf and animal health. Hmm. Uh, I think about my friends in this industry that are in so different, different niches, and they probably wonder, do we need to pass on another price increase? Because again, our employees asked for more and our warehousing didn't go down. Our cost of goods didn't go down. Our Is 2024 a year where we stop trying to raise prices or do we, and by the way, you talk about the, the ugly head of it. This is the 1970s when Gerald Ford tried to do some initiative where we all agreed to not ask for more money or something. It was it was almost it, it became a big joke, of course. But that, are we at a Gerald Ford moment asking everybody to stop asking for pay increases to to cease the inflation? It would not surprise me to see a uh, uh, an administration ask for that, and it probably would work equally as poorly. Uh, well, Biden, the Biden people. Well, Biden doesn't know what day it is. Whoever is in charge of Biden on any particular moment already said that the grocery stores and these and these greedy companies are the reason we have inflation. Completely wrong-headed, but they kind of began their Gerald Ford moment about stop raising the prices, didn't they? Yeah, they have. And what, what I think is, is we're probably in a spot, I think now, where inflation will be tamed, again, not killed, not slayed, but tamed uh, to a point where we can start to think about it in a normalized sense, where yeah, the price increases may be a little bit higher than we're used to, but they're not ridiculous and wages can catch up. I think the good news is, is that when you look at the, I, I like to say, if, you, if you're growing something, you're probably in pretty good shape because you've had three really good years of profits. You know, we're estimating that 2023 will eke out a profit on the grain side. We think 2024 with some input values coming down, you could probably get a, a maybe a $40 an acre profit there. If you're feeding something, you've got you're you're really struggling to try and stay break even or try and limit your losses. You know the swine sector is now on month 18 of of you know really difficult economics. Uh, the dairy sector has is ebbed and flowed between profitability and losses. And then if you are one more step to the consumer, so commercial ag businesses, Pro processing or process processing uh, branding. Um, things to that effect where you're actually really dependent upon the consumer making purchases. You're, you're, you're struggling a little bit. And on top of it, the, the money that's going into those businesses is drying up. The banks are, 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 are not lending as much. I think, you know, I, I'll, I'll plug farm credit. I think farm credit is still pretty active, but the banks are slowing up. 
But those people who make investments, whether they're venture capital funds, private equity funds, or corporations, the interest rates now have caused their hurdle rate, you know, what the money they need to return has become much more difficult than when rates were at zero. When interest rates were at zero, I could earn a good 5% return and be thrilled. If I'm an investor today, you know, Rates are, as you mentioned, anywhere between five and eight percent. I need to earn fifteen percent or maybe twenty, and so it's becoming harder for them to invest. So the further you are to the consumer, I think the more difficult twenty twenty four will be. The good news for us as a farm credit cooperative is that core uh, grain producer, you know, may ebb and flow in in in, in cyclical news, but is in a really solid spot. And you didn't tell me about the idea of asking for a raise uh, for increases. Well, are they going to be able to do it? Because the seed companies, the input companies, and, and again, it's not greed. Uh, machinery probably went up more in the last four years than than the overall basket of goods inflation. So you can say if anybody really came out of this on top, you might say the machinery companies. But also, there's going to be, I think, in my prediction, there's going to be a whole bunch of farm producers they're going to scale way the hell back in 2024 on new machinery. I I agree. The only flip to that is machinery was so tough to get over a couple of years that the reason inflate machinery is actually a great allegory to how inflation works. When there's a limited quantity and you have more money and I have more money, I'm willing to bid it up. And well, now the government gave me some more money. So heck, I'll bid it up again. Right. Only one of us is going to get it, but we're probably going to pay up for it. Uh, we've seen machinery costs level off. We've seen seed prices level off. Fertilizers come down a little bit. So I think I think that age of big jumps in in prices is probably over. But I don't think the ask on consumers for wages is done because we're still playing catch up. Yeah, seventeen dollars an hour at a gas station down the road from me here. Uh, for a person to stand in there, remember the people pump their own gas. You're basically selling, uh, you're IDing people for lottery and cigarette tickets, and you're getting 17 bucks an hour. So uh, there's, there's, and you don't have to do loss prevention anymore. That's not as illegal now. Yeah, well, uh, it depends on where you are in California. I think you just open the door and say, you know what, have at it. Just come in here and, uh, and just try not to poop on the floors. Anyway. Uh, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, just just go ahead and Google uh, the scenes in San Francisco, and it's disgusting. Anyway, his name is Bill. His name is Bill Moore. He's the chief risk officer with Compeer, or as we like to call him, the Chicken Little for Compeer. Every day, this guy is falling. He just has to come in and decide what crisis to focus on. Uh, but uh, all, all joking aside, he's he's got some good stuff. Economics, bringing it back to you, and agriculture. We covered the basics of U.S. economics right now. We're recording this in December of 2023. This is good data for at least the next six to 12 months. We talked about the Fed. We talked about the Fed's role. We talked about interest rates. We talked about inflation a lot. We talked about U.S. capital markets a little bit. We talked about land values and brought it back to you and agriculture, where we think things are going. Um, I would say uh, I'm, I'm right with you there, man. 2024 is going to be a little bit of a struggle bus for most ag. Uh, we're going to still be paying a lot for stuff at the grocery, at the consumer level. We're paying more for labor at the labor level. Um, it is also an election year. And your point that God knows they've not been bashful about flinging money around. I mean, they're spinning like drunken sailors, as they say. We're going to might we're 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 beyond the drunk sailor comparison at this point. And there could be a bunch of money being flinged around yet in 2024 yeah, from the federal government level. I, I agree. And you, we, we got to start watching what percent of debt we have versus the amount of money this economy generates. It's getting into banana republic territory. So that, that might be a 2025, 2026 you know, time bomb. I would like you to chicken a little, a little bit on the federal debt situation, because that's the one that scares me more than anything we've talked so far. If Bill Moore, if you want to find out more, how do I find you? Go to compere.com. I don't know. Yeah, you got it. Uh, Compeer.com. Um, if you're in the Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois area, you probably know a good financial officer to talk to. Um, and I, I think my my Twitter handle is Bill Moore, R-O-I-C, which stands for Return on Invested Capital. Uh, you can feel free to reach out to me there. 
I love it. All right. So check out all these past episodes, like 330 of them, I think, is what we're up to right now. It's amazing. Great stuff going out there with the business of agriculture. If you want to know more about what's happening on uh, some of uh, the most progressive forward-thinking farms, check out the stuff I'm recording for ExtremeAg.Farm. Uh, I've been doing that now for going on three years. So check that out. Until next time, thanks for being here. And uh, I want your 2024 to be really good. So if you stay tuned to us, we'll give you information you can use. His name is Bill Moore. My name is Damian Mason. And this is the business of agriculture. Hey, thanks for being here. This episode of the Business of Agriculture was brought to you by Pattern Ag. You've heard me talk about Pattern Ag because I think it's a pretty cool concept. New technology that allows you to predict the problems you're going to have and therefore treat them before those problems cost you money. What kind of problems am I talking about? Pests and disease, things like cordon root worm, uh, sudden death syndrome, cyst nematode, and a whole bunch of other bad things that happen out there in the field that can cost you money, guess what? Pattern Ag will let you find out ahead of time if the disease or the pest pressure is there, and therefore you're treating it before it costs you any money. What a great concept. Go to pattern.ag, that's www.pattern.ag, to learn more about their product, their technology, how it can make you money, save you yield, and all also, where you can find a rep that can come out there and do the work for you. Pattern.ag.